It's a pleasure to address this important Baku summit. Let me praise the organizers for bringing together so many people. And let me also praise the co-chairs and members of NGIC for their leadership and the contributions they have made and are continuing to make every day to global cooperation. For we meet at a critical moment for the world economy and at a time when COVID and our global and medical emergency has not yet been contained. And I want to talk in my brief remarks about the cooperation that is now urgently needed to end the pandemic, to stop climate change, to speed economic recovery, and to address concerns as wide ranging as nuclear proliferation and global poverty and their threat to the stability and peace of the world. President Kennedy once said that America should com complement its declaration of independence with a declaration of interdependence. Russian, Chinese, European leaders, African leaders have in these last 50 years also talked of a global community, indeed a global family of nations that will work together for the common good. And I want to talk about what we now have to do to achieve this. And I want to start by learning lessons from our failure to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Many of us feel that after a year and nine months of the disease, we're now on a downward slope. But the figures issued last week by the WHO and its ACT A group are frightening. Today, deaths from COVID have just surpassed 5 million. And in the next few days, the numbers infected by COVID will pass 250 million in all. But what's worrying and frightening are the projections of the WHO and ACT A for the years ahead. 200 million more cases. Deaths, 5 million so far until today, but over the next year, ACT A expect 5 million more people to die unless action is taken now. We may indeed be a little more than halfway through the damage caused by the pandemic if we do not act soon. And the reason for this continuing surge of infections and deaths is that we now face a two-track pandemic as the fates of, fates of the vaccinated and the unvaccinated diverge. Nearly 70% of us vaccinated across high-income countries where death rates are in the main falling, but just 3% in low-income countries, 6% in Africa, where death rates will continue to rise. And because we have missed the internationally agreed 10% vaccination target, target for the end of September in 82 of the 92 low-income countries of the world, and because on current vaccination trends, we'll miss the 40% December target, we will find that three quarters of future cases, 142 million according to the WHO, are now expected to occur in the unvaccinated low and middle income countries outside China. And yet, if we don't act to vaccinate low income countries, all of us will suffer later. The disease will spread, mutate, new variants will come back to haunt even the fully vaccinated, as well as sabotage economic recovery as the virus continues to beat the vaccine. So the quicker we vaccinate the unvaccinated, the safer all of us will be. You know, the containment of infectious diseases is perhaps the purest example of a global public good. In a pandemic, no one anywhere is safe till everyone everywhere is safe. And it's in all our interests that the whole world is vaccinated against the virus as rampant as COVID-19. And it should be in every government's interest to stop any country pursuing beggar thy neighbor policies that would restrict the flow of life-saving vaccines and medical equipment across the world. Put simply, this is a global problem that requires a global solution and we have the means to solve it. The world is now producing one and a half billion vaccines a month, compared with only 500 million in April. Soon we will be manufacturing two billions every month, and the North-South divide and the callous betrayal of the global South cannot now be attributed to a shortage of vaccines. Instead, the West and the richest countries hold a surplus of vaccines and they are failing to send unused vaccines south with the result that too many are going to waste. As a science fiction, William Gibson wrote, the future is already here, vaccines for all. It's just not evenly distributed. And so if we want to play our part in preventing this dystopia, then we must act now and share vaccines equitably. What is in effect the hoarding of vaccines in the global north that should have been airlifted to the global south raised profound moral questions about our ability to come together as an international community. And people are right to ask that if the world can't carry out the relatively straightforward task of distributing vaccines to those who need them, when we have the supplies to do so, then how are we going to respond to other global challenges from climate change to nuclear weapon proliferation? Only the leaders of the richest countries who have overordered vaccines and have been oversupply can now release the unused stocks to the countries that need them both. 
So nothing defines this new age more than the growth of vaccine nationalism and medical protectionism, which continues to divide the world even as we face a common medical emergency, which is continuing. But take also the climate change talks. When we need every country to get round the table and decide how each can contribute decade by decade to keeping temperatures at one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels, we will not be able to get results if each country continues to take a narrow view of what its own national interest entails and so limits the sphere in which cooperation is possible. My country first and only approaches are thus not only costing thousands of lives lost to COVID in the here and now, but failing to prevent a climate disaster in the future. You know, bold decisions will be announced in Glasgow this week to phase out coal, accelerate investment in renewable energy, speed up the transition to electric cars, champion a massive extension of forest tree planting and nature-based solutions, and commit to a net zero carbon economy by the 2050s. But the rich countries have not even been able to agree to honour their promise of 2009 to transfer 100 billion a year to the poorest countries to aid their mitigation and adaptation of climate change. And so I fear that nationalism is now the dominant ideology of the age. In the wake of the global financial crisis, protectionism burst onto the scene, imposing tariffs, shutting down borders, tightening immigration controls, building new walls. All this arose as a reaction against globalization in the wake of the financial crisis and the grand bargain of globalism that a more open world would provide rising incomes for all was seen to have failed. More recently, an aggressive nationalism that started with President Trump's America first has gone global. And we now have Russia first, China first, India first, name the country, my tribe first, jingoism, as multilateral institutions have too often been bypassed and disregarded, undermining in its wake the effectiveness of the UN, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, the World Health Organization. As Pope Francis has put it, the universal we is crumbling and cracking due to myopic and aggressive forms of nationalism. Now, of course, I'm not asking countries to abandon the pursuit of self-interest, but to understand that too narrow an interpretation of self-interest and too great a reluctance to cooperate is self-defeating. And COVID-26 COP and our experience with COVID just show how long a path we have now to travel. Now, of course, the precondition for defeating narrow nationalism is for each country to show it will eliminate all forms of cultural discrimination, economic exploitation and political exclusion that have provided the breeding ground for demagogues to build their us versus them adversarial politics. But second, we have to promote cross-border networks, as you do, that bring people together across religions and races and show, as this conference will do, how healthy and productive coexistence is possible. And then thirdly, we have to rebuild our out-of-date international institutions so that they're once again seen as successful agencies able to deliver global solutions to global problems. Most of all, we have to champion the virtues of empathy, reciprocity, and solidarity upon which cooperation and sharing are founded. In the meantime, what we have got to do is appoint a G20 coordinator so that vaccines can get to the poorest countries of the world with a month by month time able to do so. We have to show that we can reach the 100 billion figure for climate financing for the poorer countries. We have to ask each country to up its ambitions for the 2020s in climate uh, and carbon reductions so that we can have a chance of being within 1.5 degrees in future years. And of course, we have to take action to prevent nuclear proliferation, to deal with global poverty, particularly to deal with the debt problems of poorest countries and fight the inequality that exists across our world. But we can do it. 75 years ago, in the wake of a world war, which emerged from the nationalism of the 1930s, General Marshall said that our common enemy was not another country, but poverty, disease, ignorance, conflict, and squalor. And there have been great moments in history when the world has come together and fought these terrible inequities. After 1945, with the International Space Station that in the 1990s ended the Cold War in space, with action to deal with the ozone layer, with debt relief for Africa at the turn of the century, with the Paris Climate Treaty of 2015, all showing that we can come together. But to do so, we must reaffirm our commitment, banish narrow nationalism, learn from history, reaffirm two vital truths, that an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. 
and that prosperity to be sustained has to be shared.